Yeah, so the, the title of, uh, of this presentation is uh, Probing the relax, relax, Relaxion. Oh, I see that there's a typo already on the first uh, slide. I guess it's the, uh, I guess it's the spell check. So <laughs> Probing the relax, Relaxion across frontier. Well, the advantage of seminar like that is that you can maybe attempt even to fix it, but never mind, I will not do it. Um, and so before I, I just uh, show you the outline, let me just tell you that the, um, the, the, the subject that I'm going to describe here will be like a admixture of a little bit of theory, a little bit of experiments. Because we see that uh, even if we think about this relaxation as just a toy model for what is going on, then um, what is interesting is that uh, there is a, there is a, it gives you a, a different perspective of how to look at, uh, how to search for new physics. And um, this perspective includes not only theoretical uh, thinking, but also experimental, uh, um, experiment. It, it hints for a different kind of experimental strategy. This is what, what, why, it, uh, why I like it, why it makes it interesting. But some of the ideas here are, are not uh, well cooked because it's a, it's a kind of a, a, young uh, topic, so to some extent one can uh, look at uh, this whole uh, talk as uh, something which is work in progress. And more specifically, some of the stuff that we describe related to the xenon uh, anomaly or xenon nexus is, is also literally work in progress, as, as you'll see that there are some cool ideas that can be um, associated with uh, the stuff that we put in the recent paper. So now, as for the outline, I will uh, first talk about something which I call the um, log crisis or opportunity. Um, um, so you'll see what I mean by that. And I think, again, it's very relevant for, for us when we think about how to search for new physics nowadays. And uh, as a case study, this we already said, we're going to look at the relax relaxion now without a typo. Um, and then um, we are going to switch to uh, talking about the uh, ways where we, how, how do we search for the relaxion? And in the title I mentioned, uh, the, uh, across frontiers. So you see, I, we're going to describe briefly the energy frontier of, um, of collider and then luminosity, a little bit with accelerator. I'm just going to make one comment. And then uh, um, basically with the sun, looking at solar relaxion. And then I I'm going to switch and um, I will give one example how to search for this using the precision frontier. This is a, a talk by itself, so I will cover only one example. There are various ways that you can look at this with quantum sensor, but I will uh, speak here just about uh, one observable related to isotope shift spectroscopy. All the experimental um, probes that I'm going to describe are interesting because they are very timely, because there are, there are some development in recent time. And then we'll conclude. Okay, so now let me just uh, start from the, if you wish, theoretical perspective. So as, as you all know, we are kind of a squeeze between two conflicting, um, if you wish, uh, perspectives on, on particle physics. The first is that we know that there's new physics. I think people, would not argue about this. We know the neutrino masses, the, the baryon symmetry of the universe, and dark matter. On the, other hand, on the other hand, if we think about our safest bet to where we're going to find this new physics, it's in fact associated with the, the hierarchy problem. So we'll go back to that in a second. And that uh, coming from the perception that we have TV new physics. And this TV new physics will be also associated with the dark matter particle, and then we would expect generically that the LHC and the direct, uh, direct the dark matter experiment will find this uh, new physics. So this was very nice uh, picture before the 2000s, but now we are the 21st century. And now that all of these experiments came none with null result came empty, uh, this motivates us to reevaluate our thoughts, okay? And in, in particular, not only just keep pushing on the same paradigm that we were holding, but thinking a little bit outside of the box. So this is the, the thing that I'm going to describe today. And in addition to that, uh, this also, from this we can derive maybe new search strategies, so we'll get there. 
We begin, however, just with uh, talking about, uh, thinking about this in a new way, so searching, about, searching for new theoretical paradigm. Good, so let me start just with the conventional wisdom, if you wish, if we go uh, some uh, five years ago for me. Um, then I think most of the efforts uh, was really dedicated uh, um, because, uh, for Steve, in your physics, because of the following perception. Um, so the Higgs was uh, our anchor to new physics. Now we discovered it and it's more or less how we expect it to be. So uh, I think there are no surprises here. And if you now couple it to the notion of naturalness, then you expect um, some TV new physics, which will be associated with the, if you wish, screening the sensitivity of the Higgs as a fundamental scalar to um, quantum states that living at the uh, much, uh, a harder scales, okay? So the, the idea is that this screening requires symmetry and this symmetry requires a TV new states. Now I would say that still this is the most compelling story, but uh, as we said, because of the recent uh, prog experimental progress, then it's maybe um, we are start questioning ourselves. So now uh, the conventional uh, wisdom is, is like that. So we will try to look for the partner of the Higgs and also the other standard model particles, in this case, the most relevant ones, as you know very well, are the stops. And if we're thinking about dark matter that I was describing before, then maybe the neutralino. And uh, the way we search for these guys is, for example, um, um, shown on this uh, typical plot that you see from the LHC experiment. In this case, from a CM CMS, you see on the vertical line, you see the mass of the neutralino. Let's take it uh, for a second to be zero and we look at the strongest bound that we get on the stop mass, and the, the bound on this stop is like a 1.2 TV. What I want you to uh, pay attention is that uh, this horizontal axis is a polynomial in the mass of the stops. And it's not for nothing because uh, to increasing the bound by a factor of two right now is almost impossible. Even if you wait uh, 20 years of LHC or maybe uh, of this order, we can maybe reach a, a factor of two, but it's extremely hard. And this is, of course, because we are talking about the energy frontier. And this is why everything here is shown on a, on a polynomial scale okay, or a linear scale. And now, if we, however, think about uh, the null result as a hint for something else, then maybe, maybe we can uh, find new kind of explanation for why we haven't found anything, still without giving up on the fundamental uh, idea that uh, the Higgs mass is screened away from radiative correction. Now, there were several ideas recently coming um, and addressing this issue. I will not, I will not uh, describe all of this. Um, as I told you, I'm going to uh, focus on one, one model which belongs to these uh, new classes. And, and I, I should say that because these are all young ideas, then it could be that they are all just misguided. So all of them are just uh, wrong and they are hiding behind some uh, anthropics idea, which make them to me much less interesting and also much less relevant for experiments. So um, uh, for now, we're just going to assume that this is not the case. So if this is not the case, then maybe there's a point to study this. And there are in what common to many of this is that there are new scalars, some cases uh, um, a weakly interacting scalar. And we will be focusing on this relaxion scenario because it's very concrete, okay? So despite the fact that the cosmology of, of this um, framework is very, very bad, uh, so it's uh, very singular, um, the QFT, okay, the Lagrangian, the quantum field theory that is associated with it is very simple, in fact. You can write it in uh, like three, four lines. And that implies that uh, we can uh, study this in a very uh, specific way, and we can get uh, some uh, uh, phenomenological signals, uh, and, and therefore there's something here to study. So in this talk, what we'll, we'll do, we'll just follow this specific idea and see where it leads us. The bottom line, before I start with all the formula, is that there's, a, a, in this scenario, what, is what we guarantee to have in relaxion model, one new scalar. This scalar is ALP-like, so axon-like particles, um, but uh, which could also be a dark matter particle candidate. 
but despite the fact that it's a, an axion like particle, it um, is associated with CP violation, actually spontaneous CP violation. And because of that, it is not an eigenstate of, of P or CP, and it mixes with the Higgs. So a lot of the signatures that are associated with these guys will be related to the fact that the, uh, it behaves in fact as a scalar which mixes with the Higgs. But beyond that, what uh, would be cool, as you'll see later, that its potential is very, very weird. So if you are thinking about the uh, generic uh, QFT, then you'll see that it's not satisfy your expectation, which make it cool. Now, searching for this scalar, however, leads to what I call log crisis. So let's see what's the parameter space for such a scalar. Um, so uh, this is describing this parameter space. Um, in the horizontal axis, we have the, the mass of this uh, scalar. And on the vertical axis, we have a uh, sinus theta H phi, which is just uh, later, I think I switched it to, to sinus theta, so I apologize in advance. But what is uh, uh, this sinus theta? This is the mixing of the scalar with the Higgs. So to some extent, you can think about it as a very weird Higgs portal um, candidate. Now, if you just look without glasses at this, at this uh, plot, I'm not going to explain everything here. So you'll see that uh, the, um, uh, the coupling, sinus theta spends some 30 order of magnitudes, and si similarly, the mass is, uh, is covering almost uh, 30 decades of energy. So that means that in order to search for this guy, we are thinking about a very a vast parameter space, and uh, I call it low crisis or opportunity because now you see that we cannot focus on a narrow region and work on this uh, linearly or polynomially in terms of the masses, but we need to uh, consider very many um, frontiers in order to find these guys. And this leads to already two interesting uh, um, um, lessons. But let me first uh, just highlight the frontiers in the following slides. So um, you'll see I, I took the same uh, parameter space and then I sliced it to a uh, different energy which, uh, and, and coupling, which will correspond to what we call the frontier. So if you look at the highest possible uh, relaxation mass, um, then the, in order to find it, we need to go to the energy frontier. This is uh, around the GV, a bit above uh, GV. So this is the energy frontier. Then we have the luminosity frontier um, right here. Then we have the astrophysics and cosmology. And finally, we have the precision frontier. So you see now how it, uh, um, how it um, um, uh, linked with the title. So if we want to find this, we need to do this uh, across frontiers. So I already um, said that the, the uh, second the lesson that um, the search require um, many decades of energy to be covered. And uh, the first one is to, we need to do this uh, across different frontiers. So this is already different from the way we look for it with stops and supersymmetry. Now, I think that uh, without uh, just a little bit talking about what, what is relaxation mechanism, it will be how to make a progress. So um, let me uh, do this. I don't think it will be sufficient for you uh, to understand the whole thing, but at least it will give you an idea. So the first ingredient that we put is that we look at the coefficient of age dagger age. This is just uh, in the standard model, this is just a constant, the mass square of the Higgs. And what you see here is that uh, it has two terms. And in general, this mass parameter becomes a function of the field, phi. Okay, so that's already a new thing. What will happen is that this field phi, the, the verity which of this, this field phi is not going to be constant along the cosmological evolution of the universe. As we will discuss later, maybe it's not even constant when we look at different uh, region of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the, um, the cosmos, our universe. So what will happen is that the, this mass will change because the wave of this phi change. And naively, if you are, if you just think about naturalness in a generic way, then you think that, okay, the Higgs uh, 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 mass, which here um, uh, is the whole mu square, will be just given by some, if you wish, uh, mass parameter correspond to some threshold effect related to some new particles that the Higgs couple to. So this is lambda square. This is the highest uh, scale in the problem, if you, if you think about it generically. And what will be the, a successful relaxation model? A successful relaxation model will be if uh, at the end, 
when you are uh, looking at the universe at uh, zero temperature, if the second term is such, such that the web of phi is almost exactly canceling this lambda squared, so mu squared is much smaller than lambda squared. Okay, that will be a successful attempt to solve the hierarchy problem. So this is highlighted here. So in order to solve the hierarchy problem within this context, already di very different than what you say when you do, when you talk about supersymmetry or something like that. And um, um, this will be if, if this mu squared of the v of phi with the web evaluated today is much smaller than lambda squared. So that will be the magic of this theory. Okay, that's the first term. Now, um, as we said, because uh, we have some non-trivial cosmology, phi actually, so the field phi coherently changed with time. And in order to arrange for such a thing, we will have a non-trivial potential, okay? So the trick here is to be able to write a technically natural potential that will satisfy the requirement that I just uh, spell out. So this is the potential, V as a function of phi. It has uh, two terms. Um, one term is just uh, Gilad, can you ask can I ask a question of course yeah absolutely. Uh, um, um, you haven't actually written down the you know most technically natural potential at this level right I mean um, you can still write terms which are of the order of you know uh, lambda fourth cosine Phi yeah 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 so, right? of course yes yes, and yes. That, that completely destroys your solution so I, of course, I am not going to show you the whole uh, story, as I said, but you need to remember that this phi is subject to a shift symmetry, okay, because it's an alp. So what we- no, It's a periodic field, it's a periodic field. It's a periodic I mean, field. Yeah, yeah, you, you only yeah. think of the gauge portion of this symmetry, right? And so that's why I said cosine phi. Yeah, and, yeah. And so that, if, you will write, if you will write a cosine phi, now the, the coefficient of this, may or may not be a lambda to the fourth, right? Depends yeah, no, on it could, you could, you should put it, your own paper, you know, if I follow your own paper, I should put it in Planck to the power fourth cosine phi. Uh, right, because even, you know, the, the Planck scale preserves the periodicity, right? So right. no this one tells me the quantum gravity is not generating M Planck fourth cosine phi. Right, right. So this is if you really uh, want to, to have no uh, new physics beyond uh, just, uh, if you wish, uh, quantum gravity, right? So I will be uh, indeed much more modest. I will assume that uh, the scale lambda is in fact much smaller than uh, the scale M Planck. It's uh, sufficient uh, to get something interesting, even if this lambda is, I don't know, 10 TV. Because already then you will not be seeing anything at the LHC and maybe apart from this scale. And then and mainly at, the, at, 10, at, the, at 10 TV, you can put either, um, um, you know, composite, composite excitation of, uh, of uh, phi, or you can put supersymmetry or many other things. In fact, people already wrote these uh, theories. They are, they are, I didn't write all these references, but uh, there are uh, several ways where you can, in which you can UV complete this theory. So what I'm going to do indeed, I'm going to be modest. All I'm going to try and write a theory that uh, up to the scale lambda, there's nothing more or less apart from maybe singlet states and this uh, phi, okay? So, so this is my uh, thing. And if you will uh, indeed uh, consider the, the relaxation scenario, and I'm talking here about the inflation version, you will find that uh, the lamb this lambda in fact cannot be very big. It cannot be bigger than roughly 10 to the 8 GV, okay? So for sure, if you want to go from 10 to the 8 GV, say to the Planck scale, and you want to screen the scale 10 to the 8 GV from the scale 10 to the 18 or, or 19 GV, you'll have to have more, uh, one, at least one more layer. Okay, so I apologize, I apologize that I'm um, cutting many edges here, and uh, rounding um, edges. The, the second, second, we... second question uh, related yeah. to that. Um, there was a wonderful paper that came, uh, Geraldine and other wrote about um, relaxation itself giving the stopping mechanism by itself. How does right. it, in, in the standard picture, what you showed the, the, the Graham, Kepler, and Legend and the story, how much the story gets changed because of the, when you take into account the, uh, the self generated uh, yes, stopping the fragmentation effect. So, yeah. the, so, um, there, there are two ways to realize the relaxation. I, I didn't even uh, have a chance to introduce it, but the, as you'll see in the version that I'm showing here, and this is not, uh, not a coincidence, um, 
there are two ways to um, establish the relaxation mechanism, to realize the relaxation mechanism. One is where the relaxation is evolution mostly happened during inflation, and then in order to make it, and then the, if you wish, the Hubble friction makes it slow moving, slow rolling, so that uh, in a second I will, I will discuss about uh, these wiggles. So it is, because it's slow rolling, then it stopped at the first uh, few wiggles. But there was in parallel another proposal by, uh, so this is the original uh, proposal by, by uh, Rajendram uh, Graham Kaplan. Um, the uh, other proposal was uh, proposed by uh, um, Cook and Tavares. And Pardon they, the instead, of, uh, instead of having um, Hubble friction, they actually introduced uh, coupling to new fields and the production of these new fields created a friction for the, uh, for the field. In that scenario, basically, the fragmentation, uh, the fragmentation uh, that was identified by, uh, by Geraldine et al. Uh, was more or less showing that uh, uh, the, um, this uh, mechanism of uh, uh, stopping the particle by friction, by particle production, doesn't work. Okay? But uh, on the uh, inflation mechanism that I'm going to describe now, it's actually going to be very beneficial. It's going to help because it's uh, fairly hard for the inflation to stop it. And maybe I will mention something about this later. Okay? This is why I'm actually focusing on the inflation, which is still uh, not only that it's viable, to some extent it's became even more viable, especially our scenario of dark matter um, um, the dynamical misalignment is be becoming more viable because of this uh, effect. Geraldine et al. Thanks. All right. Um, so let, let me let me just explain what is what what is going on in this relaxation. Okay, so we start with just a, a potential which is is uh, relatively shallow and it has no much feature. If you think about what uh, Tuin was mentioning before, cosine phi over f, think about f being very very big compared to your resolution in this plot. So you can just expand it, and all that you see is just a constant term and a linear term. So this part that we are looking at now is, is just uh, this uh, linear part of the potential. And because this f is huge, we will never be sensitive to this f. Now, there's another term in the potential, but the, the other term in the potential that we'll write, uh, which we call a Beck reaction, will be sensitive to the web of the Higgs, whereas uh, the roaming is not sensitive to the Higgs uh, web. And that means that uh, if we are in the unbroken phase, in the symmetric phase of the electroweak, then if you wish here, you see that the Higgs is at uh, age equals zero, then um, we don't see any disturbance in the potential, so it's just this uh, very, very smooth function, and the relaxation is rolling. Once the Higgs will, uh, once the relaxation will pass, uh, this critical point where the mu square change its sign, and you can see here in this term that uh, upon a suitable uh, uh, choice of, of signs, then there will be a region where the mu square will switch from being positive to negative, electroweak symmetry breaking will be induced, and now uh, the, this back reaction which create these wiggles will emerge. Okay, so that's the idea, and here I have a graphic for this, so you see the rolling is, is happening, so the, the relaxation is rolling down, till it passes this point where the uh, mass goes to zero, mu square goes to zero, the Higgs mass becoming negative, and at, at that point, the Beck reaction potential is generated, and uh, it has wiggles because it's a cosine, if you wish, term. And uh, suddenly, a minimum is generated. And if the Higgs is very slow moving, we just discussed this part, then it will stop. And here, um, I'm assuming that it will stop in the first minima. We are going to discuss it in length later. Okay. And now, uh, this is, if you wish, the Beck reaction potential. So you see, I, I wrote this term as just the mu squared h dagger h cosine phi over f, and it's in fact very easy to write a theory like that that will generate this potential. All right, good. So now, um, uh, now that we understood this part, let me just uh, uh, compare it with just the Higgs portal. So when you think about the Higgs portal, I, I denote here as s, so we are not going to get confused then what are the physical uh, parameters of such a theory? We have a mass, we are going to have the relaxation mass also, so that's uh, one relevant parameter. We have a cubic term, this cubic term will just generate mixing between the Higgs, uh, which require a web, and this uh, singlet. So here you see the relation between uh, sinus theta, this mixing that I showed before, I should have added H5, 
uh, sorry about this, and, uh, and the mass. Um, and there's also a quartic uh, term, which could be important, by the way, for luminosity uh, frontier experiment like phaser or Matusla, but I'm not going to touch it today. Um, and um, we see that um, it's pretty much similar to the same parameter space. But what we are going to see is that in the case of the relaxion, you will be violate uh, what you would expect uh, from naturalness or simple naturalness uh, um, requirement that uh, uh, apply for this uh, scalar, this new scalar S will just say that the mixing angle should be much less than the mass divided by the vector. So if I know what is the mass, I can see what is the maximal mixing angle that I can achieve. And of course, this mixing, mixing angle will dictate all the phenomenology. So it's very important for the experimentalist to know where are we on this parameter space. And you see there's very interesting thing which, which going on for the, for the relaxion. OK, um, so what are the three differences between just uh, relaxion and generic Higgs portal that will be very crucial in a few slides? First of all, you see that this mixing angle that I would just describe has both upper bound and lower bound. And um, the upper bound is much, much above the naturalness uh, bound that I showed you before. So not only by factor one of two, you can actually violate the naturalness bound in this theory by factor of thousand, even though it's totally natural as we just agreed. Okay, so that's very uh, cool. In addition, there's one more thing, uh, you'll see it later, the distance, if you stop at the first minimum, the distance between the first minimum, the first maximum of the, if, of the relaxion theory is very small and that could lead to a new set of phenomena. And in addition, there are action like a, a parity, if you wish, odd coupling that uh, are associated with the original action nature of the relaxion, but we're going, not going to discuss it uh, today. So, Let's uh, pretend that uh, we're trying to uh, naively understand the parameter space of uh, this theory. So we have this uh, cosine potential. We are very familiar with that because everybody know QCD axion. And we know that uh, pretty much it's, uh, it's easy to understand what's the mass and the coupling. Because we just look at the back reaction potential. The back reaction potential was something like mu b, h dagger, mu b squared, h dagger h, cosine phi over f. So for example, if you want to get the mass, we just take the, the second derivative with respect to phi at the minimum. This is the, the, this, the, the way we do it for a, for a QCD axion. If you want to look at the mixing angle, again, we need to look at the two by two matrix and the, the off diagonal term is one derivative with respect to phi, one with respect to Higgs. Once we have this, we found the, everything. So naively, if you do this, you'll find indeed the naturalness bound that I just described for a, a, a scalar portal that is, this, this uh, cannot be bigger than M over V, and um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and you, you have a minimum and maximum uh, mixing. Fine. So here you see this. Here is the parameter space of this uh, Higgs portal-like theories, sinus uh, theta is a, is a function of M. And you see that you cannot go, low, go below something because you want to solve the hierarchy problem. It's a, it's a compact uh, parameter space. And then uh, this is the uh, fine-tuned uh, Higgs portal region. And this is the allowed parameter space. However, the situation is actually interesting, much more interesting than that. So in order to see that, um, at least to understand the, the, the intuition, why this is not so simple is like that. So here I wrote the full potential of the, of the relaxion. Um, so this is, if you wish, the Higgs uh, mass square. This is what we saw before. We have the, the linear term that we were describing. We didn't write it explicitly. And then we have the back reaction. Notice that uh, one of the tricks is that this F is different than this F effective. This F effective is much, much bigger than the F. This is why the frequency of the wiggles are much, much uh, uh, faster than the one of the rolling potential, which was very smooth. Um, and then we solve for the relaxion uh, uh, stopping point by, by comparing the derivative and equating it to zero because we, of course that's where the relaxion is going to stop. But here is the interesting thing. Once you look at the evolution of the relaxion, an interesting parameter is to understand what happens, how much the web of the Higgs is changes when you go from one wiggles to the next wiggle. Okay, we have all of these wiggles and we just suppose that we just move one wiggles from one minimum to the next minimum. 
The VEV of the Higgs is changes very little. This is because of the fact that this term is in fact very, very small. And the scanning, the resolution parameter for how much the VEV of the Higgs changes is proportional to the ratio between the Beck reaction part parameter, mu b squared, and the cutoff of the theory, which could be very small in fact, much smaller than one. So it means that each time the relaxon is, is moving through one wiggle, then the VEV of the Higgs is only changed in an incremental way. Now, let me show you how it looks when I look at uh, this uh, graphically, because of course the algebra is not so nice, yuck. So if I look at the, uh, at the uh, derivative of the potential with respect of the, to the field phi, this will be the red line is, is where zero is. So in order to uh, get a minimum or maximum, doesn't matter, I need to cross V prime equal zero. So v, to remember V prime equal zero is either where the minimum or the maximum of the potential. And now what you'll see is that each time when you go from one maximum to the next maximum is, uh, is when the, you go from one, uh, if you wish, uh, minimum of, the, of, the, of just the wiggles to the next one. Now, because we said that the change of the Higgs each time we go from one to the other is only changing incrementally, then you see the, the, the slope of these uh, tips changes very, very slowly. So that means that uh, the first time when I'm going to hit zero, I'm going to, to see the minimum, then it will be very close to the tip of these wiggles, which means that uh, the angle will be very close to pi over two. And also you see that immediately after you cr cross it once, you cross it again. The first time you cross it, V prime equal zero is the minimum, okay, because it was going down all the time then there was a minimum. And then immediately you see that there's another crossing of zero. This is the maximum. So this is highly non-generic potential. The potential is in fact very, very shallow because if the tip was a bit, would have been exactly at, at zero, so not sticking up, this will be the point where the minimum and maximum meet. So it's exactly, if you wish, a, a saddle point. Uh, but uh, the resolution parameters is not zero, it's finite, even though it's very small, um, mu b squared over lambda squared, it's very, very small, but not zero. So you are going to miss the zero by just a little bit. And therefore you have a situation where the minimum or maximum are very close to each other and the potential is very, very narrow. Um, it's very, very shallow, sorry. So that means that in fact the mass of the relaxon, unlike say QCD action or usual, I don't know, even composite Higgs or or little Higgs, whatever theory that you are familiar with of, uh, of, um, uh, of a compact parameter space, the, the mass here is very, very shallow. It's much smaller compared to the mass that you will derive just looking at the back reaction potential. By how much? By this parameter, scanning parameter delta, okay? So here you see now the same plot that I showed you before, but now accounting for this uh, case. Now, what is fascinating in the relaxion um, is that basically the um, mixing angle, as we said before, is still coming from the most uh, naive calculation, one derivative with respect to Higgs and one derivative with respect to the uh, relaxion. So it means that since it's, uh, the Higgs only appear to the leading or in the back reaction potential, the mixing angle is not suppressed at the same time where the mass is suppressed. So relatively, for a fixed mass, I can get much bigger mixing angle. And this is reflected in this plot. So again, sinus theta, the same parameter as, as, effect, as a function of phi. The black line here would be the naturalness line naively. And the green line is what, where you in fact find the maximum mixing angle, now accounting for this shallowness of the potential. And remember, I promise you that it's not going to be a negligible effect. It's a factor of thousand. Okay, so if your all experimental signature depends on large mixing angle, then you are in a very good uh, shape now. There will be another effect. The other effect will be uh, related to the fact that the minimum or maximum are very close to each other. And uh, this we're going to describe in the context of, of the xenon, but I want already now to explain it since we already look at these uh, graphics. Again, V prime as a function of phi, remember? So V prime as a function of phi. At the first minimum, you, we see that the distance between the first minimum maximum is very, very small. It's again, function of delta. 
What does this telling us? This is completely different type of physics. It means that the, the, the this potential of the real axiom is such that it's very easy to destabilize it in one direction. So if I just move it a little bit in the direction where the slope is negative, then I can uh, uh, just tip it a little bit and then it will be completely destabilized, okay? Now I think uh, this is one of the examples why uh, I told you that even if it's a toy model, it has nothing to do with solving the hierarchy problem. It's very interesting because it leads to um, kind of enigmatic uh, QFT, okay? So, so this is why it's uh, kind of nice. Um, right, so there is, there is of course power counting, I'm not going to go to that, but just remember that it's very easy to tip the relaxion outside of its minimum in one direction. Excellent. So uh, now that, that we talked a little bit about the theory, let's see what, can, uh, uh, what kind of strategy it can uh, allow us to search for this uh, relaxion. Now, in the, in, the, in the plot that they showed about the low crisis, it's already clear that if we just focus on one frontier, suppose we just look at the, uh, at the energy front, we think about the future collider or something like that, then we'll have a very good sensitivity to this, guy, this kind of a phenomena to search for the relaxion. But of course, the mass parameter could be in a completely different region. So the, when I'm talking about the experimental effort, I will talk about the different frontier and not focusing on one of them. But still, let's start with the energy frontier, the most important one. Um, and I'm going to show you again the same parameter, uh, the mixing angle. Sorry again about uh, omitting this H5. Uh, this, one, this time in logarithmic as a function of the mass. Um, and uh, this is a real, this is related to some work that we did, but also some work in progress. Um, so uh, you see here we are focusing on a relatively massive relaxion above then typically above one GeV. And um, <clears throat> in the, so I'm, I'm looking here at two different regimes. The first regime is, is more related to the physical regions where the relaxion is. So you see here the upper and lower bound. And you see that already left has covered part of the parameter space. You see here the bounds from the uh, untagged analysis of, uh, of LHC and the invisible hills. And then you can see here lines uh, of improvement, what will happen when we go, for example, if we have something like uh, um, um, ILC, uh, Z phi analysis, or uh, Giga Z, again, um, when uh, the, the um, the process that you're looking at is uh, Z production, and, and then the Z goes to Z star, like an off-shell Z and, and a phi, so the signal could be something like LL phi, okay? So this is Giga Z, and this is Terra Z, this is really FCC EE region, if you can uh, provide, if one can uh, have an, an uh, experiment that will produce 10 to the 12 Z's, it will help to basically cover the whole parameter space of this theory, so this is very interesting. Now in the, in the plot on the right, you know what? I think I'm, uh, I'm going very, very slowly. Um, could you remind me um, how much time do I have? Uh, we started at five, so uh, around 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes. Okay, okay, so then you know what? Let's, let's this is not a relaxion, it's related to a, a time, timing detector at LHC, but since it's not uh, very important for relaxion, I will, I will skip it. And I will move now to one comment that uh, I want to have about the luminosity frontier. So again, same parameter space. I've, I hope that you're not getting bored by looking at sinus theta versus M all day long. Um, but here we are looking at much uh, lighter masses. You see here, this is maybe the KV to GV region, uh, which is important to luminosity frontier. And I'm t I tell you that I'm going to tell you things about timely results. So as you know, right now, we are fortunate that we have two Keon factories running on, running on. one at the, at the um, at CERN, basically. This is the NA62, which we is looking at K plus to pi plus mini bar transition. And then we have also Koto, which is looking at the K long to pi mini bar. And um, in this case, um, as, um, Presumably some of you heard that the, the, in Koto there are maybe a um, um, signal candidate for something which looks like um, um, a pi naught and an additional missing energy. It's not clear yet whether this is a signal, maybe it's a, just a background event because that's more or less the first time they are looking, they were opening the box. 
But if it's true, then it leads to very interesting phenomena, maybe violation of Grossman Nierbaum to the expert in the, in the audience. And also there's a, um, in that sense, there's a, some tension with the NA62 results. But to this uh, discussion, what I want to show you that if you are taking the photo result at the face value, then you'll see that the K to pi phi amplitude will be, um, have the right uh, strength uh, if sinus theta is of the order of 10 to the minus four. And this is kind of nice because this is an empty region of the parameter space, okay? And this is only uh, allowed for relaxation model in this region if you are violating the naturalness bound that I uh, showed you before. You see this black line is the naive naturalness line and you see that to go above the black line means that you're already fine-tuned, so you're already exploiting the, uh, this peculiar uh, feature of the potential of the relaxation. So this is kind of nice. Aguilar? Yes. If, if you really want to use the relaxation to, um, to also go after Koto, um, uh -huh. what extra term do you need to write apart from the ones that you have already written down in your... Uh, Very good tool. I'm happy that you are, you are, you are preventing me from... Uh, rounding uh, corners here, absolutely. So if you will look at face value at uh, the result from, a, um, from um, Koto and NA62, you find, and also by the way, a, a little bit from uh, the, the previous, uh, so the predecessor of, uh, of, uh, of Koto, you will find that uh, the, you need the phi to decay in order not to be in violation of the Grossman near bound. So the Grossman near bound, even though it was written for the, for the case of the standard model, it's actually very powerful for new physics. There, there in fact, one paper, which was 10 years before Grossman near, that was looking at the uh, at, uh, final state, which is the pi phi, where the phi is the Higgs. So they were already noticing, but because it's a scalar, then you don't need CP violation. So even K long to pi uh, phi is, is actually saturating Grossman near bound, but still it's going to be violated by two sigma. Uh, or, or even yet yeah, uh, 2.4 sigma if I remember correctly. So there are two options for you to win. One is th that you'll accept that you, ex you, um, you just uh, take this uh, uh, result at face value and then you have like a 2.5 sigma violation of the Grossman near bound. Or you can add a term such that the phi decays to gamma gamma. In principle, there is coupling between phi and photons. And then if you uh, write the, the right coupling, then what will happen um, is that, um, uh, what will happen is that at, um, at um, um, NA62, uh, once they see a signal which has a pi plus and two photons, they will reject it because of their triggering. And uh, this is because they have huge background from pi plus pi zero. But at Koto, it will still uh, look as, as a missing energy because it will not uh, decay in time, and therefore Koto will accept it. Mo there's even more than that because Koto can, uh, so there's a recent uh, paper that wrote on that together with uh, Stefania, uh, Gori, and, and uh, Toby, Toby uh, Shako. So in, in that uh, thing, we actually show that uh, Koto can uh, significantly improve their analysis looking at the uh, pi not final state plus X goes to gamma gamma resonance, and then they can increase their sensitivity. So this is what, what I was uh, hiding behind this uh, statement. So thank you to him. Um, just, just one more, sorry to nag you again. No, no, um, sure, of course, of course. Adding, adding a term in which phi can decay, is it, is it okay from the back reaction point of view now? We're using, uh, now if I use the servant paper as well? Yeah, so, so you can do uh, two things. So you can add the uh, phi goes to FF, which is not so nice because then it's uh, another term that breaks the shift symmetry. You can actually close the loop and get the uh, phi phi, so it's like contribute to the mass. But you can use the fact that the uh, phi is actually an alp and you can write phi FF tilde through anomaly or something and then it will not uh, lead to a mass, okay? So it will protect the, it will uh, preserve the shift symmetry. Okay. Um, right, yeah, in, in this, uh, we did um, uh, some model in the paper with, uh, with uh, Stefania and Toby, you can look at that, and, and then indeed we chose the FF tilde. But since then there were several papers about Grossman near violation and, and all kinds of uh, models were written, and I think it's not so hard to make it consistent. That's my conclusion, because of the fact that there are so many proposals. Um, 
Good. So, and I know there are experts here in the audience as well. So now I'm going to switch gears. So we talked a little bit, or not a little bit, we talked about the luminosity frontier. So I'm not going to try to cover ground. Let, let's uh, make a deal. Uh, so uh, I need to finish at uh, 3.30. That, that's it, right? I don't want to drag people too, too long. So yeah, I will tell you about- 3.35 roughly, yeah. Okay, well, let's leave time for questions. So uh, I think I will not tell you about the precision uh, frontier uh, stuff, but uh, I will tell you about uh, our thoughts associated with Xenon, okay? Because there are some, some nice things here, um, which are maybe goes beyond the, the Xenon thing. So one other way to search for the relaxion is not using uh, our experiments that are trying to create huge luminosities, but to, to use the sun, and uh, of course, the sun is a great source of, uh, of, of uh, relaxion uh, production. And so you can look at the, at the, the process where you produce the, the relaxion, mostly through Bremsstrahlung, and also at lower energy, there's also resonance processes. And this uh, relaxion will just propagate from the sun, will get to xenon, nothing will stop it because we're talking about very small mixing angle. The coupling is 10 to the minus uh, 14 or something. But uh, uh, when it hit uh, the when it will hit uh, the xenon, then of course, uh, if it's light, uh, it might uh, interact with the electron. So not going to give the, the conventional classical wind signal, but uh, uh, kick off ionized an electron. This electron, of course, will create scintillation, and that's the way you can look at this. And this is, in, in fact, was the um, subject of uh, our uh, paper from uh, a year ago before this uh, xenon anomaly came out and uh, we calculate the spectrum so you see this this is the the spectrum as a function of the of the energy of the relaxion and uh, you see that the flux indeed is huge even if uh, we looked at coupling which is 10 to the minus 14 um, and I, the only thing that I wanted also to mention that if you go to low energy, there are resonance production which uh, allow it to be enhanced. This is a property of relaxion or scalar particles, but not the uh, ALP signals. Um, right, now, um, what, what I wanted to tell you is about uh, um, two other things. So uh, let me see, which way should I go? Um, First of all, uh, I just mentioned the resonance spectrum. So you'll see if the, if you look at this plot, it's again the flux as a function of the energy. If the uh, relaxion is, is light, okay, if the scalar is light, um, as was shown in this paper, then it is also mixing with the longitudinal mode of the photons in the plasma in, inside the sun. And then you get a huge production. So what you see here in dash line, is the production of the scalar without the resonance effect. And if you look at the solid green, then you see the, the resonant effects. So you get very big enhancement, however, at the lower energies. And what we did in this uh, uh, paper of 2019, we looked not at the S1 signal, so I guess no time to tell you what is S1 and S2, but I'm assuming that most of you know what it is. But if you just focus on the S2 signal, then the advantage is that the threshold is not 1 keV as the threshold of S1 because of background, but you can go down to 100 eV. And you see here the uh, events, first the um, photon uh, energy. This is almost the energy of the incoming uh, particles, not, not exactly. And what you see is that uh, for coupling, which is 2 times 10 to minus 15, uh, this was the kind of uh, signal that we see. And this is the background. It's not exactly consistent with the background, but that wasn't our point. Our point was that in the future, already now they have like factor of uh, 30, I think more data. And in the future, they'll have much, much more data. So you can search for that, so for such a, a feature in the spectrum, even though you don't know the background. Okay, so that was our point. For S2, they don't exactly know what is the background, but uh, since we have a, um, pretty nice feature, this will be interesting. Okay, so I want you to remember this point. So this is emphasizing why S2 signal could be also important. Um, so uh, for, for, this, uh, for this case, we got this bound that uh, the coupling is less than 10 to minus uh, 15, and sinus theta, if we interpret this as, as a relaxion, less than 10 to the minus 10. Okay, now I want to go back to, oh, sorry, pretend you didn't see that. 
Now I want to um, uh, go back to the signal of, of the recent analysis of xenon that came uh, some uh, maybe one month ago already. And this one is focusing on the S1. So it's uh, a little bit less sensitive to low energy, but it's very sensitive uh, above 1 kV. And also you have a background model. So this is the events versus the energy. Now you see this, this red is more or less showing the, um, if you wish, the sensitivity, okay? So if uh, you see that the, the effective sensitivity curve is rising up very quickly uh, above KV, but below that they are losing the sensitivity. This is a bit tricky because when you look at the, the signal, or, or first of all, you can look at the data, you see that the, most of the anomaly, if you wish, or most of the excess is only in the second beam. And as many of you realize, that means that you may be sensitive to issues like migration and all this stuff because uh, you don't have much room to uh, see to make sure that you are controlling uh, your effective background and rejection. So that makes many of us a little bit uncomfortable. But anyway, that's, that's the data as is. So now the question is uh, whether, whether you can... Uh, whether you can explain such a thing in our framework. So here on the left side, you see um, now the coupling, the scalar coupling to the electron as a function of, of phi. Um, and the, you see here two different uh, curves when you do the chi-squared fit for the signal. So you have the, um, first of all, the assuming that you're not floating the background, so you just take the central value of the background, which is not always a smart assumption. But anyway, let's just play this game for a second. So here you see the best fit point, and then you see one sigma, two, three, two and three sigma. So if the background is fixed, if you know it 100%, then you can, uh, you, you might be attempted to say that we have a three sigma or more uh, uh, excess. But one of the background that they, they were not sure that they have it under control is the tritium. So if you float the tritium background, and, and marginalize it, then you see one sigma, two sigma curve, that's the dash line, and then somewhere between two and three sigma, you always, you are already consistent with coupling equals zero, which means that you can account for this anomaly just with background. So anyway, this should be taken with a grain of, of, of salt. And we can also look at the shape of the signal. So this is, again, the number of events as a function of, of the energy, but now, Unlike for the ALP, because the spectrum is more sharp, um, you can compare, remember, we, I showed you before the, the, the shape of the distribution of the incoming flux. flux. You see that if you're looking at the massless relaxon, unlike for ALP, then it doesn't provide a good fit for the data. You need kind of a more massive um, relaxon. So the best uh, uh, fit point is somewhere between, like around uh, two EV, okay? with coupling, which is like 10 to the minus 14. So this is what is required to explain the data. Is this good or bad? Well, the question is how much you believe the range, red giant bounds. So if you look at the signal, so let me just uh, first uh, go to this, uh, to the parameter space on the right. Again, our sinus theta, beloved sinus theta versus M, then uh, what you find is that uh, in order to accommodate the signal for this case, you are a, a this.
um, and um, so it's 10 to the 5 uh, EV cube, which means that uh, you can, uh, this, this tadpole can be totally destabilizing the reaction, which has all kinds of interesting uh, implications, but I'm only going to say that to, to some extent it behaves as a chameleon and it's uh, throw it away from, from the minimum as a response for a density. And usually chameleon model, if you have an experience with that, are very, very finely tuned. Here it's not finely tuned. So, well, it is finely tuned for low energy. Hello, Jila. Can you hear me? Uh... Hello, Jilal? 